And we have come to our final panel, ladies and gentlemen, perhaps the most important transformation and powerful transformation today is taking place in the media. Now, I may be a little bit oversensitive to this because this is what I do for a living, but there is no question that the rise of social media and the internet has totally changed the way we receive, digest, and discuss information. Typical of media, our moderator, our regional moderator, Alison Smale, has been called back to her reporting task for the refugee crisis. So Nikos Kostandaras, managing editor of Kathimerini, our publishing partner here in Greece, is taking her step and looking at the power of this new media and digital age to transform democracy. Joining him are Valerie Plame, author and former CIA operative based in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Georgia Albentino, public policy head, Google Cultural Institute, based in Paris. And Antonio Mujica, founder and CEO of Smartmatic Group, based in London. And Antonio, perhaps we can organize an electronic voting uh, next year. But the president of uh, the New York Times, Mr. Stephen Dunbar-Johnson, will deliver the result of your referendum to the British director, the British Museum director at our Art for Tomorrow conference. Uh, Nikos, over to you. Hello, is this on? It's a great honor to be here in Alison's, uh, in Alison's position. And uh, I'd just like to make a little note about that, that we live in a digital era where everything happens at the same time everywhere, but we still need to be somewhere else very often. So she has to be covering the story of the refugees, and I'm uh, in her place here, and it's a, it's a privilege to be here, and especially with this great panel. I'd like to start off with just a short little introduction on my part. I believe that humanity is in a period of great transition which applies to the individual everywhere and also to societies as a whole and, and the individual in that society. It is also affecting societies' relations with each other, states' relations with each other, superstate relations with each other. So everything is changing right now. And I think that we can talk about that with this panel today, specifically because of the people who are here. I'd like to start off with um, Mr. Antonio Mujica, who is the founder and uh, CEO of Smartmatics, which is a company that is involved with the building blocks of democracy. They, they hold digitally, um, digital elections, uh, which is the way, the way forward. Um, Georgia here is from the Google Cultural Institute, which has a grand plan, and that is to save the cultural heritage of the world by uh, reproducing and, and keeping as much as possible in, 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 in our um, daily lives, basically, because now we can reach everything. And Valerie Plame is um, an incredible story, with life like a novel, now writes novels as well, and uh, has great experience and understanding of the nitty-gritty of how security works and how we are going to go ahead in the, in the, um, in the future here. I think after, the, um, after Edward Snowden's uh, revelations, we all know that everything we thought would happen is happening and a lot more will happen. So we live in a very different era. We are very different. And I'd just like to finish with a little a point I took from uh, Kisho Mabubani's uh, comments, which was a throwaway line, which was how the, in Asian countries where there was no fundamentalism, young people are being uh, radicalized because they see, and he said, they see on their phone and they feel it. And I feel that we are actually beginning to turn into another life form, and that is the connected one through digital technology, which opens up a whole new... Uh, web of relationships, a matrix of relationships, if, if you will, but between us, but it also leaves us open to a lot of exploitation. So I'd like to start off with a positive uh, angle here and ask Antonio to tell us about the digital era. How much more good does it have to offer us in terms of society, democracy, and building on what is good in society through these new technologies? Thank you very much, Nikos. Thank you very much, everyone. Well, I believe the advent of the information age is really 
a huge force for democratizing everything. I'm, I'm sure George is gonna tell us a lot, for example, of the democratization of information. And of course, this has all sorts of consequences. Um, I think something that's happening now is because this is so new and because this is touching everyone else, everyone's life, what we're seeing is that there is a significant lack of understanding. And I think there's sometimes misplaced fear on technology on some fronts. And in some other fronts, there is also excessive trust on some other technologies. And I think this all will evolve as we get more familiarized and as we see the evolution of all these information technologies, um, let's say, moving forward. In our case, we have been developing technology to make governments more transparent and more efficient, specifically elections more transparent and more efficient. And uh, I'm a big believer that you can use technology for good or for bad. You know, this happens from the, you know, from the prehistoric times. A knife, you can use it to cut your food or to kill a fellow human being, right? So the important thing is that we try to use it for good and minimize the bad. And in, in a sense, that's what we're trying to do. It's just an example, but I think it's a, it's a relevant example elections and the corruption that usually goes around elections to try to skew the vote or to reduce the integrity of the vote or tamper with the vote or sometimes uh, simply the errors that are introduced in a complex election can be reduced greatly by the inclusion of technology, of course, good technology, uh, which is another point. There is good technology and there is bad technology, so you can have a, a very well-designed product that is fit for purpose and you can have a product that is not fit for purpose and it might produce even the opposite result, right? So I'm a big believer, of course, in technology and, I'm, and just by looking at history, uh, I'm very optimistic about the future because technology has normally only introduced, let's say, long-term benefits and not the opposite. Thank you. Georgia, uh, Google is Google. Everybody knows that it is a massive organization that uh, has huge uh, ambitions. Now, in, on the cultural front, we understand. We also understand the validity of it now in the in the era after Palmyra and after the damage done, in which we tend to forget in uh, in northern Iraq, which might be more important, uh, Nimrod and Nineveh and things we might never have found. We might never find in the end. Um, this. And everything is at risk, but isn't there also a risk in gathering everything in one spot and perhaps becoming a little bit complacent that everything that is there is everything? Yeah, um, let, let me, taking your, your question, let me start from actually what Antonio said and start from there. So I, I, I strongly believe, but I think that this is a shared point, that technology and the web ensured more democracy because, of course, uh, it allowed freedom of speech, it allowed transparency, or if government endorses uh, uh, transparency, it can be a fantastic tool, as you, as you proved, to help citizens to know more and to have uh, governments accountable for what they do. But I believe, I strongly believe, and that's why I'm working for the Cultural Institute, that there is something more that perhaps is not as discussed or well, let's say, known, that is the power of uh, culture plus digital for democracy. And I come to your point. Um, I, I believe that uh, uh, knowledge as well as culture can be incredible tools for democracy. Because basically, if people know and understand where they come from, the story, the history they come from, the diversity of culture around them, and all this kind of thing, perhaps they, it will be easier for them to understand where they want to go and have a more open-minded uh, vision about, about uh, themselves, of course, but also about society. So going back to what, what we would like to do at Google is not, is not just to put everything online, which is good, but is the Google Cultural Institute uh, main objective, main aim, is to have the cultural heritage that is art, art history, and the most iconic places um, accessible online. 
And uh, the point to me is that this will allow, of course, people that are not in the cultural bubble or are not in those elite, like us perhaps, that are already uh, in touch with art, with culture, with history, to know more about it. So, of course, you will have one point where all this will come, but I think that the very positive point is that it will allow access to information, of course, but access to culture that is an incredible tool for democratization. Valerie, the, one of the major concerns of every state is security, and we know that um, there are armies working on this in every, in every country. We also know that the great concern of the citizen is privacy and um, the personal protection from violations. Um, what is happening in the real world? What, how, how does this work and what can we expect to see? Thank you, Nico. It is a delight to be here. So Google's motto famously is do no evil, which is admirable. But we now know, certainly with uh, the NSA revelations from Ed Snowden of two and a half years ago, that there's a vast world out there of uh, collection that maybe, you know, maybe the intent is not uh, for the good. Although we're constantly being told that it is for our, uh, our, it's in our best interests and it's protecting us. So this notion, it, it, what I've looked at a lot is what is the appropriate balance in a healthy democracy between security and privacy? Uh, this has long been a question, but it's really come to the forefront now in the last two years. Um, I don't know uh, how it was received, uh, uh, those revelations so much here in Europe, but I know in the United States, as news started coming out and uh, there was a sort of a collective shrug. You know, I, I'm not a terrorist. Who cares what the government is collecting on me? I, you know, you're, they're just getting my text to my boyfriend or whatever. It doesn't, it's fine. It, I, we're, it's keeping us safe. Um, and then as more and more information came out to the incredible extent and how robust in particular what the NSA was doing, um, people did start to question and say, you know, <laughs> certainly historically we know that uh, when governments collect vast amounts of information, the potential for abuse goes up significantly. And sure enough, it's always those that are creating trouble that uh, the government uh, tends to look at very carefully, whether it's minorities, political activists. Uh, and so that is what I'm very worried about, is the potential for abuse. And uh, we've seen there's been some pulling back, but uh, he's, he's left now, the former head of NSA, General Keith Alexander. His motto was, collect it all and it wasn't cultural, okay? Um, the, and you have to ask, is it, how is this really keeping us safe? Uh, the NSA assured the world that all this information that we're collecting, that they thwarted, uh, they said, you know, a couple dozen terrorist attacks, but the information on that was uh, pretty thin at best. So I am highly skeptical of uh, the, all that information that comes in to be able to sort through it, um, finding that balance against what uh, we in liberal democracies find to be really the, under, the underpinning of what we want, the security versus privacy. Uh, these are, it's a conversation that's worth having rather than certainly in the United States, uh, there are many who just wanna shut it down and not talk about it any much more. So do you feel that the, the watchdog um, bodies are not doing their job the way that you would want to see them do it? Oh, absolutely. Congress has completely abdicated their responsibility. 9-11 uh, was traumatic, not only for the United States, but for the world. I mean, the world has changed profoundly in that time. Uh, but I would 
uh, also argue that in sort of typical American fashion, we overreacted in many ways. And the pendulum swung too far. Slowly, slowly, we're seeing it come back. But uh, for years, uh, we lived with, uh, you always knew what the threat level was. Uh, you know, any, everyone flying here, you know you had to take off your shoes and take the change out of your, all of that. Um, we live in a completely different environment. Uh, and it's, uh, it, I, again, I go back to the potential for abuse. There are many examples in the United States of the government already putting its nose in where it doesn't belong. So what's, what stops it from, from doing, what could stop it from doing that? Is there any debate on how to improve the, uh, the mechanisms that keep tabs on what the government does? Well, there have been a couple senators, there have been some very brave voices in U.S. Congress that, you know, are raising their hands saying, uh, wait a minute, yeah, we need to sort of review this here and how far the, the uh, letter of the law was quite different than, in fact, how it was carried out, the Patriot Act and so forth. And that has been, pulled, certain sections of that have been pulled back. But it, it really, I think, is so important, talking about the, the, the good side of information technology, getting these stories out there, uh, spe you know, speaking aloud of uh, where, uh, I'll give you an example. Um, Glenn Greenwald, who, uh, was instrumental in uh, the Snowden leaks, of course, uh, was writing for The Guardian, and now is with an, another media uh, platform. But uh, one of his colleagues at The Guardian was writing a book um, about him, about this episode. This was only earlier this year. And uh, he was writing a lot of passages on Silicon Valley and its very, very cozy relationship with the NSA, US intelligence. And this didn't happen once, this happened several times. He would be writing on his laptop computer, the book, and as he was writing, the paragraph was self-deleting. Yeah, so that's like minority report. It's like, pre, you know, pre-censorship. Uh, so it's very important that we have a conversation in our democracies about how much we're willing to take. If you want to be perfectly safe, you know, move to North Korea. You, you know, there's not going to be terrorist uh, uh, attacks in North Korea. I'm, I'm thinking, what would the ancient Athenians who came up with the idea in the first place do in this case? I think they might go back to the basics and elect by lot a small body of citizens, completely by chance, who would have oversight of what their secret services were doing. Um, has there been any thought of a, of a jury system to look over <laughs> these things, or is it part of the whole security complex? This only? is a complicated big subject. The President Obama did appoint a small, you know, blue ribbon group, but every time there's a problem, there's always a blue ribbon group assigned to it. Nothing really comes of it. Um, and it's the same with that. Um, it, 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 there are voices uh, that are pushing back against this, but uh, fear is a tremendous motivator, Tr uh, and we've had we've had pretty much constant fear mongering in the United States since the 9/11 attacks, which is not in any way to diminish their effect and and so forth. But uh, it, uh, curiously, at least right now, is the U.S. presidential race is getting underway. Uh, I haven't heard any candidates speak about that yet. And um, there was a little bit I saw, uh, it was on a John Oliver show, who's sort of, sort of a successor now to the, the, the late John Stewart. But he went out, so John Oliver went out into Times Square and was asking people about Ed Snowden, you know, man on the street interviews. And this, the, he swore it was not edited. They were all like, well, uh, he, uh, Sold, well, sold secrets was about as close as most people could kind of get to what had actually happened. And they just, most Americans have no idea of how deeply this affects their civil liberties uh, and how we move around in the world and how democracies, what they would look like going forward. 
Antonio, you're, you're also involved in ID technologies and the protection of, uh, of data and so on. And we know that at least uh, in, in Europe, people are very suspicious about what happens with their, uh, their personal information. Uh, in today's uh, International New York Times, there's a report uh, that, says, that quotes uh, a survey done by a, a commission by the European Commission that finds 81% of people here in Europe are, are, feel that the governments do not protect them. Uh, in terms of uh, their privacy. Are there, are there ways to really protect uh, our privacy? Absolutely, and I think technologies are being developed as we speak that are gonna increase privacy and that are going to increase security actually for everybody. Of course, there is a big debate, let's say, between the intelligence community, you know, the NSA and, and the equivalent in different countries, and what's you know personal privacy because you know if a terrorist wants to have personal privacy you know it will render the intelligence um, forces you know um, ineffective but i think what we're going to see i don't believe regulators understand the problem well enough nor that we can create a panel like the one that you suggested uh, that would be effective i think what's happening is i think the power is really with citizens or as corporations call them consumers because they will choose what technologies to use. And you're seeing a big change in the way even big companies like Google and Apple are providing now, let's say, better technologies and more private technologies to their customers. And you, I think you're gonna see this increase, something in which we invest significant amounts of money every year is in technologies that increment privacy and technologies that make sure that nobody can tamper with them. And of course, there'll be a bit of an arms race there, and, and, and there'll be opposing forces. But I think this is going to happen naturally and is in a way unstoppable. So it, I believe it's a, a problem that will resolve itself, uh, in a sense, by the creation of more and better technology. How do you ensure that you're a step ahead of the bad guys? Well, there is. Well, depends who, who you're calling the bad guys, right? Um, I think when it comes to things like privacy and security, you can actually develop technology that guarantees that your information is gonna be kept private. Um, and there are new technologies coming out all the time, like for example, now the blockchain technology. So if you wanna have a ledger and you don't, have, you don't wanna have a central authority controlling the ledger, you can install you know, blockchain technology, which is what's underlining Bitcoin, and now they're looking for other uses for it. And so there is technology that's inherently effective to solve a very specific problem, and I think we will see that. Now, if we provide technology that guarantees privacy, what you will not be able to have is the ability to wiretap into terrorist communications. That's absolutely, I mean, that's, that's a natural you know, uh, consequence of it. So in a sense, we would need to choose, but I don't think there's any regulator that's actually calling the shots here. It's just a natural evolution of, again, citizen behavior and technology. It's a very interesting gray area that uh, needs its compromises, and it'll be very interesting if we learn how they are made. Can I please, comment please, on please two please points that coming. actually you made? So I strongly agree with Valerie about the importance to have a discussion about those topics. Let me give you an example. In, I think, but I could be wrong, 2010, uh, Google was under a cyber attack from China, and actually we made it public, we said it, and we were the only company, Google was the only company saying it. It's pretty strange that the only addressee of that attack was Google, which means that, of course, at that time, people, other companies in general, were not really willing, of course, to say it because otherwise the users would have said, okay, wait, let me go to another operator or another company because this one is not secure. So I think that from this small example, it gets to your point that it's really needed. A, a, a debate about it and to talk about it is really needed. Then the second point about security and privacy. Well, security and privacy are the two faces of the same, of the same coin. I don't know if you can say it in English, you can say, you can say it in Italian. Um, uh, so, and also we have moved from one extreme that was the post uh, Snowden revelation to another extreme that is the Charlie Hebdo 
uh, terrorist attack. And of course, I mean, it's a super difficult topic and one should try to stay away from failing and try to understand what is the balance, what is the balance between these two elements. And uh, I agree actually with Antonio that uh, uh, there is a big responsibility on big companies having a lot of data, uh, such as the digital companies, about the security of, uh, of, uh, of users, of customers, of citizens. Uh, but I also believe that those companies or this environment is really developing or doing their best to develop tools that can protect uh, those data. So encryption is the clear example. So since long time, all the Gmail um, email are encrypted. This is an example. Now is also maps, uh, search, etc. On the other side, of course, this does not allow governments or anybody else to just access this information because they are encrypted. And it gets to the second point that is that most probably more streamlined or more clear uh, procedure for governments to request uh, lawful access to information should be should be underway or should be discussed because imagine that I'm Germany or I'm Italy and you are and you are uh, the United States of course if I want some data from a company that is in your territory of course the United States want to have a say into this debate so it's not an easy procedure because we are talking about all the governments of all nations that want to have a say of course into the handling of data of their uh, citizens. Exa I, exactly. To your point, uh, so the NSA handed out what was called uh, security letters to companies, let's say AT&T, Verizon, others, to say, uh, you cannot make this public. You can't even say you received this letter, but you have to give us, I'm being very simple here, you need to give us all your communications. So yeah, what's missing from that is any sort of democratic, any sort of transparency or accountability uh, in this process. Right, they might be coming up with fabulous ways of encrypting, but you know, at least the US government takes a really dim view of that. Very dim view, and in fact there was, uh, um, what was one of the security companies that shut down rather than give the government their list of users. Uh. Yeah, I, I think what we're seeing here though is if we look at history, we will see that technology comes first and then socio-political organization comes right after. For example, Western democracies and you know liberal democracies like we know them today are a direct derivative of the Industrial Revolution. I mean, that couldn't have happened before. Uh, the same happens, you know, when the flow was invented, you know, I don't know, 5,000, 10,000 years ago. Um, there's extensive literature, by the way, I don't plan to, to, to bore you with that. But we're entering a new stage, we're entering the information era. So I think we're going to see socio-political organization completely change in the next 50 years. Many of these problems which, which have to do with jurisdiction, you know, is this who has the right to ask for what and what are going to be the rules and is it the law of the US or China or Italy uh, that applies in this case and what is the data located really? Is it in the US? It's nowhere. When we say it's in the cloud, it's really in the cloud. Um, so I think these problems, you know, the current legislation and the current socio-political organization is completely obsolete to deal with these issues. And that's what you will see, I think, over the next 50 years, a complete revamp on the way that, you know, we are organized, you know, in the entire world as a society. And I think what you will see as well, and we're working on some of this, is the tools of engagement between citizens and governments to have a more fluid dialogue. Because even, let's say, the current liberal democracy, and I'm sorry if I'm sounding too far off and, and too futurist here, but I think you know, the current uh, democracies are not necessarily servicing their citizens for all their needs and utilizing all the technologies that are available. And I think that's going to change, though, and it's going to change in a, in a good way. So you will see a lot more tools come out, most of it having to do with information technologies, 
that will allow for a more continuous and a more dynamic dialogue between citizens and governments. What is, where is the pressure for the change in that direction coming from? What makes you make a better Google? What makes you make a better uh, voting system? Is it what, what the desire to, to be better at this comes from where? Is it from the general sense in the culture that we need more privacy, we need more protection? Is it because of competition with others who are trying the same thing? Because there's no regulatory body somewhere saying be better at this. What, what drives you to be better? Uh, if I can very quickly, I think that is the trust of the citizens. So for, for a digital company, the pivotal, the most important element is that the, the citizens trust, uh, trust them or trust it. So if trust is the driver, of course, you're doing as a company everything that is possible to keep you, you user, uh, keep trusting me as a company and therefore to keep safe and secure your data, et cetera, et cetera. And you get a lot of feedback from your customer, obviously, because he's now empowered to... Of course. ...to and comment immediately on what's happening. Another example, um, we published the transparency report, what Valerie said. So all the requests from the government get into a report. You cannot imagine the positive feedback that users g provide about this. This is another signal. Yeah, I just wanted to add, so... We're, we're sort of at the 30,000 foot level here, you know, pretty broad, but you're talking about how citizens uh, using technology to make government work better. The truth is most citizens, what you care about are there are potholes on my street, the trash is not being collected, there is a, a house with broken windows, this sort of thing. And uh, he's the Lieutenant Governor of California, Gavin Newsom, former mayor of San Francisco. He's really big on making government work better through technology for the governed. And uh, so he is, he's spoken about, and certain municipalities around the states have started this, where, for instance, you take a picture on your cell phone of that pothole and you send it in to City Hall and say, this is at the corner of Main and Third, do something about it. And that is when, that's I think how you build trust, if of course the pothole gets fixed. Uh, that they go, ah, okay, information and technology is being used to make my little world a little better. Definitely, and uh, it, because technology becomes so much a part of us every minute of every day, um, do we have any idea of where it's going? How much are we going to become part of our technology as well? I say this because uh, we've seen things like Google Glasses, we see prosthetic limbs, we see uh, medical devices. We, and I, it's, not, we're not, it's not far off before we have memory enhancement, for example, or something. <laughs> something I, would be, I would be the first in line for that. But uh, we are opening ourselves up to a lot more uh, contact with the rest of the world without the necessary anti-contamination devices. So um, is there a debate going on about that as well, about how we function as individuals now in this broader planet? <laughs> the, wi the wired people. <laughs> yeah, that's more for Google. You know, they have one of the best R&D um, efforts in the world, I think. And actually, a couple of their technologies we will see rather soon, like self-driving cars and the one I'm actually rooting for is life extension with, with Calico, um, which is technology, but now biotech, right? Look, I, th I think clearly there, is, there are some bets that are being placed on things like, you know, driverless cars and electric cars, you know, big with Tesla. And uh, of course, um, there is a lot of artificial intelligence going on to, you know, conduct a lot of interesting tasks. And as a platform for visualization, I think basically all of Silicon Valley is betting on virtual reality happening somewhat soon. If you've never tried a virtual reality set, I suggest you do try it. It's extremely impressive. Um, and of course, with those new technologies, there will come new things to worry about as well, right? Uh, but that's, again, that's the case for technology since we invented the knife, who knows, you know, how long ago. So I think, you know, those are all things that we're going to see. I believe that the net effect has tended to be positive. That's why humanity is more enlightened and better today than 
2,000 or 5,000 years ago. That's why you don't die out of a caries in your tooth, of a cavity in your tooth today, but you could die out of a cavity in your tooth 2,000 years ago, even if you were the king uh, and the richest person. So I think technology has a net pos positive effect, and I think a lot of people, a lot of talented engineers, and a lot of uh, let's say like-minded people are actually trying to develop these technologies that in most cases are created with the intention of doing good. Um, and there might be some exceptions like weaponry, of course, but... Uh... That, that's a very positive note. I'd like to add a very negative note. Um, technology is the new weapon, it's the new way of living. Can a democracy that has even the minimal accountability deal with the challenges of a world in which not every country is a democracy and is not as accountable for the way it wages um, digital warfare? We've seen the first skirmishes of this. It could develop much, much further. Is there something that needs to be done so that we can protect ourselves? Is it, uh, I'm rambling, perhaps we need little militias of people when necessary to be trained citizens trained the way they used to be trained in the militia to deal with with issues like this I know it's a crazy question but uh, I wanted to are you talking cyber warfare cyber, hacking cyber warfare hacking and the fact that every one of us has a very powerful computer in his hand from now on rather than sitting there is there some way of being prepared for um, for these kind of uh, attacks thank you <laughs> um, let me start with an example, and of course this is a general point. Um, terrorism and the use uh, of uh, video by the young people to, to really, yeah, and social media to, to really understand uh, how to be part of a terrorist group, etc. Um, it's true that is through technology that of course these people can know about, and uh, uh, in, the, in the previous panel, we were talking about the fact that at the University of Indonesia, I think, uh, one trend is, uh, is coming through, through, through social media. But another example is that nowadays, through social media, there are a lot of young people that are basically uh, sending messages against terrorism and against extremism. So today, if you type jihad in YouTube, you will have a lot of counter speech, what we call counter speech. Basically, young people saying, w providing, let's say, positive messages. So I don't know if this is an answer to your question, but in general terms, and again here we are very, very high level, but the web allow people that jump on a mountain and scream bad things, allow other people to jump on another mountain and scream good things. Mm -hmm. Then your question is a little bit more difficult because it's more precise and I don't have an answer to that. But definitely this is a phenomenon that you see and is allowed by the digital. Um, that, you're absolutely right, but uh, I, I think, uh, think of the uh, hack hacking that we've seen over the just the last year uh, in the United States allegedly the Chinese has just hacked something called OPM Office of Personnel Management 24 million records of those that have applied for federal jobs it is in a, a huge intelligence nightmare the worst problem is that uh, those in the government that should be responding we don't have the, uh, the expertise if you have a choice of uh, working for Google and making uh, a really nice salary versus, uh, you know, you're a really talented hacker, uh, I don't think a, a government salary is going to be as attractive. So, right, is it going to be citizens vigilantes or is it going to be governments that somehow get their act together to push back against, I'm, I'm talking now, nation-sponsored uh, cyber attacks? I am told we have uh, time for one question, so um, I don't know how we will how we will judge the. Uh, 
I, I don't know if I'm allowed. It's, it's not really a question. It's more uh, uh, just two points, which, which are, you know, uh, you're talking about uh, the balance between privacy and security and this sort of idea uh, that always comes up that somehow uh, information technology is always running ahead of us and we can't quite control what's done with it. And I just want to make these, these two points, and it relates to the previous panel as well. Um, uh, the, the levels of fear are astonishing uh, and always push this idea. But when you actually look at the numbers, and I just use as president of, international president of Penn, uh, the numbers are not at all what we think. Of the over 200 writers, journalists killed every year, about 170 of them are killed by Western democracies or their allies by governments, corporations, and organized crime, usually working together with Mexico, China, uh, 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 Vietnam, uh, Russia, uh, Honduras, and so on. A very small percentage are killed by Islamic or other religious extremists. So the whole idea that we have to give up large parts of our freedom of expression and citizens' rights because there's this wave coming over us doesn't show up in the numbers. And of the sort of eight to 900 writers and journalists in prison today, what I would say if it's 900, about 800 of them are not in prison because of any form of religious extremism. So the fear is not related to the reality. The second thing is that we have laws, we have charters of rights, we have bills of rights, we have international laws. These are perfectly applicable. The reason that Mr. Snowden is not in prison today in the United States is because he's a physical person who dealt with technology and is in Russia. Had he been in the United States, he'd be on trial. So that can be turned completely around. There is absolutely nothing which prevents governments from holding to account Google or individuals or people who uh, uh, deal improperly with privacy and to put them on trial. There, we have laws which can be enforced in the technological area just as they're enforced in other areas. And finally, um, Privacy is the other half of freedom of expression. That's where we figure out what we're going to say in public. And there, this, is, this is not about a balance between privacy and security. It's about a balance between freedom of expression and democracy and fear. And having this idea that technology is not controllable is simply not accurate. We're perfectly capable in responsible democracies of controlling as much as we want. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this is obviously a debate that's going to occupy us for the rest of our lives. I'm very happy we were all together today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nikos. Thank you, Georgia, Valerie, and Antonio.